That's the foundation. And the church of Jesus Christ is built upon it. Any true church is built upon this foundation of the message of Jesus as set out by the apostles, as written down in the scriptures, there is none other. If a church, if a teacher is not grounded in the gospel message, they are not building a church. They are building something else. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller. Glad you're with us today. And Jonathan, what are the, the things that maybe we can be looking out for that will show us or kind of indicate whether or not someone is building a church or just building a platform and, and uh, a brand? That's a great question, Steve. And there's no easy answer to it. But I think, I think there are things we need to be looking out for when we, when we choose a church to belong to and a, a ministry to participate in or a ministry to support. We really want to be sure that the Bible is at the very center of what's going on, that the Bible is actually being taught. You know, not simply that the Bible's being used as a, as a sort of springboard for the teacher to say what they want to say, for the pastor to say what they want to say, but that the Bible is actually the foundation and the Bible is being opened up and the truth is being proclaimed. That's central. We want to look at who's really being exalted through the ministry. Is it the, the leaders and the superstars within it who, who have the platform, or is it the Lord Jesus Christ? So that those who have hold of the microphone at any point in time are actually pointing folk to Jesus and lifting up Jesus and exalting Jesus. And we want to make sure that the gospel's being proclaimed all the time, that people are being invited to come to know Jesus, to receive his salvation, to trust in him and look to him. And I think if those things are going on, you know, those are signs of fundamental health. And, and the Lord Jesus Christ and his word, they are the building blocks for the church. And if Jesus and his word is, is not foundational and central to all that's going on, you know, it's trouble. It's a sign that this is a danger zone. Hmm. Well, I'm glad you've uh, given us a few things to make sure that we are kind of looking out for, w walking into church in a sense with our eyes open. And we're going to continue to look at some of these truths today from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 23 is our focus. We begin a message called Ministry That Builds the Church. Here is Jonathan. If you've ever been involved in a building project of any kind, you will know how vitally important it is that the building is built properly and well with the right materials of true quality at every stage. It's possible, of course, to build something quickly and to make it even look attractive, perhaps even impressive, but to build it in such a way that the building cannot stand the test of time. I don't know what you think about this. I tend to think that the 1960s was a pretty bad time for building, for architecture. You know, 1960s utilitarian and brutalist buildings haven't generally aged very well, in my opinion. Back in the UK, where we lived for uh, many years, the 1960s was a time of quote-unquote modernization, a time of kind of clearing out the old Victorian and Georgian buildings and putting up these sort of squared-off modern structures constructed of the latest sort of innovative materials, generally that program, which was taken up very enthusiastically, especially by government departments, it yielded terrible results. While I was doing my doctoral studies, I've mentioned before I worked as a teacher in a, in a very historic boys' school in London. The school itself had been founded in the year 1509, although they'd moved locations a number of times. The last location of the school had been a rather grand red brick Victorian building in West London. But in the 1960s, the school had this opportunity to buy a bigger piece of land south of the river to relocate, which they did. And on that land, they elected to build a gray box-like structure covered in pebbled sheets of concrete with no architectural merit of any kind attached to it. By the time I was involved in the school, the 1960s blocks had aged really badly and were near the end of their usable life. There was no way they could squeeze more years out of them. They were so badly built. They just had to be torn down and reconstructed. And so a massive campaign was undertaken to tear down the whole thing and to rebuild. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is using the imagery of a building to teach us about the nature of the church and the way in which the church of Jesus Christ is constructed. 
And he wants us to see that care is needed at every stage. He is wanting us to see that only the finest materials will do. He is wanting us to see that the quality and the integrity of God's building the church, it matters immensely to God himself. God owns it. God loves it. God will protect it, and he will hold every worker to account for the work they do on his precious building. As we dig into these verses together, a key thing, perhaps the key thing that we are going to discover is that local church ministry matters. It matters. How God's building is put together, it matters to him. It ought to matter to us. You see, if our perspective is that church is our hobby, it is a recreation, it is a social activity that fills a part of our weekend when it's convenient to do so. If that's our perspective, well, this passage will turn our assumptions on their head, and it will tell us that gospel ministry within the church of Jesus Christ is more important and more significant than we can possibly know or imagine. God cares about it more than we realize. And the long-term implications of good ministry or of bad ministry are more weighty, more far-reaching than we might ever assume. And so perhaps as a corrective to our outlook and to our assessment of what really matters— Paul has three truths for us here concerning the ministry of the gospel within the church of Jesus Christ. Three truths about the way in which God's great building, his church, is built. And the first one is this, God's great building has only one foundation. Notice it again with me there in verse 1. According to the grace of God given me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. To hearken back to another school building, a different one, I remember when I was at high school in Toronto, my high school undertook a great building project. The project uh, provided, I guess, a degree of entertainment and diversion for us because it, it progressed all around us during the school year, and we got to observe quite closely what was going on at every stage. Part of the project involved filling in a, a courtyard in the middle of the school with a, a very modern addition. The school building itself was quite traditional, kind of Georgian in style, built around all these courtyards. But this one was going to be filled in with a multi-story modern glass annex that would join up with the historical building on multiple floors. It was quite fascinating to watch the building work take place from the classroom windows in the old building surrounding the courtyard. At first, they had to excavate this old courtyard quite deep. I think it was a two-level basement uh, below and then a foundation below that. So, so the thing went really far down. One thing that really interested me was that they undertook the foundation work in the middle of the Toronto winter. So it was pretty cold when they were pouring the concrete. This was some years ago. And at that time, that was really quite novel. Normally, you waited until the, the warmer weather to pour a foundation back then. But it was explained to us, and they told us, that they were using very innovative technology at the time, specially formulated cement that was engineered chemically to be able to set well in sub-zero conditions. I, of course, knew nothing about such things. I still know nothing about such things. But I remember thinking to myself, that just feels like a little bit of a risk. You're investing millions of dollars, I guess, putting up five or six stories of cutting-edge building, all on a foundation of concrete that has to do its best to set properly in the middle of the Canadian winter. The building might be beautiful, but if the foundation isn't solid, disaster looms. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called Ministry That Builds the Church. It's part of a series called The Messy Church and a Majestic Gospel. And we have to pause right here, but we'll get back to the message in just a moment. You know, some of us have those in our lives who are hurting and we want to love them well. You may struggle to know how to do that, though. Well, Dave Furman can relate to that. He's written a book about that entitled Being There. And this book we would love to send to you is our way of saying thank you for your financial support this month. You can give online right now when you come to EncounterTheTruth.org or call 
833-998-7884. Being listener supported, we do depend on your financial generosity to keep this program on the station. So again, we'd love to send you being there as our way of saying thank you for your support. Again, our phone number is 1-833-998-7884, and our website is EncounterTheTruth.org. Let's get back to the message. Again, here is Jonathan. A little while ago, I watched a TV program with one of our kids all about the building of some of the tallest skyscrapers in the world. And of course, these great looming towers, 100 stories tall and more, thousands of people living and working in the many cities in the sky. They sit on this very small footprint, don't they? They rest on a foundation that's got to be deep and it's got to be strong, firm, and reliable. If the foundation is bad, well, it is a disaster in the making. There is one foundation for the church, one true and stable and safe foundation and one alone. It is Jesus Christ himself. It is the message of Jesus Christ. It's preached by the apostles. That is the only foundation possible. It is the only foundation the church could ever have. Now, again, the crisis in Corinth stems from the fact that the members of the church were choosing their favorite leaders, if you remember, and they were rallying around different teachers within the church. We've spoken about that at some length in our series already. You'll remember that that some within the church, they liked Paul. Others weren't so keen on Paul, but they liked Apollos, or others liked Cephas. But Paul wants to be clear. Anyone who is engaged in authentic gospel ministry, anyone who is truly building the church, they are only building on the foundation that he laid as an apostle of Jesus Christ. They are only building upon the foundation of the gospel that he, the Lord's apostle, has proclaimed. And so, of course, no one could be so arrogant as to write off the apostle Paul. No one could dismiss his ministry. No one could sidestep his work. According to the grace of God given to me, Like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. Someone else is building upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Paul the Apostle had a special role assigned to him, a special grace given to him by God, and it was to communicate the message of Jesus Christ in authoritative terms, to lay out the gospel message truly and clearly, to take the message of Jesus and his cross and to set it down so that the church would know it and believe it. Paul preached that message at Corinth. He recorded it in his letters And with the other apostolic writings of the New Testament, we now have this foundation, the apostolic message, fixed in written form in our Bible with clarity and with truth. That's the foundation. And the church of Jesus Christ is built upon it. Any true church is built upon this foundation of the message of Jesus as set out by the apostles, as written down in the scriptures, there is none other. If a church, if a teacher is not grounded in the gospel message as recorded in the apostolic writings of the New Testament, here's the thing, they are not building a church. They are building something else. And of course, that only makes sense. Jesus and his cross, Jesus and his gospel, that's everything for us. That is all we have. The message of Jesus is the message that there is forgiveness for the sinner because the Savior died. It's the message that there is acceptance for the unacceptable because the Savior was first rejected. It's the message that there is life from the dead because the Savior rose from the grave. It's the only message that brings any hope for the future, any comfort and purpose for this life. It's all we have. Now, before we we move on from this foundational point, there are two simple but profoundly important implications from it, that the church has one foundation. The message of Jesus Christ as proclaimed by the apostles is communicated by the scriptures. The first implication of this is that we need to steer very clear of any movement or organization or so-called church that does not have its foundation in Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, in Paul's Jesus. 
You see, there are plenty of movements and cults around that are not built on the one foundation. They may claim to be churches, they may claim to be Christian, but they are built upon a different foundation. They don't accept Paul's proclamation of Jesus Christ. They don't accept the apostolic message. They have their own version, a false narrative, and the foundation is different. Beware of them. Beware of them. See, Paul is very concerned about Christian unity. He hates all the infighting at Corinth. It's one of the reasons he's written this letter. But he's very clear. Unity is only possible where the foundation is shared, where the basis is sound. Unity is only possible where the church has been built on the one foundation of Jesus Christ. Don't be fooled by a fake movement, a fake church, a false Christianity. Don't be pressured ever into pursuing unity where there is no shared foundation. There is one and one alone. The second implication here is just to remember that we do not and must not take credit for establishing anything when it comes to the church and the work of the gospel. If we've been involved in gospel work and gospel projects, if we've participated in funding any movement, if we've contributed to planting a church, if we have participated in world missions and so on, we need to remember that we are only ever builders on a work site, but the foundation has already been laid. Jesus has done it all. He has given his life. The apostles have proclaimed the word and set it down in the scriptures. The credit does not go to us. The initiative, the innovation, the impetus, it's never ours. So we must be careful never to overstate our own role or overestimate our own importance. God's great building, it has only one foundation. That's the first lesson. And the next one is this. God's great building must be built with care. Notice Paul's admonition at the end of verse 10. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. He continues verse 12. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. In your workplace, in your profession, I wonder what are the ramifications and the implications of shoddy work. I mean, I wonder what happens if you do something poorly or you use low-quality equipment or materials in your work. We have some surgeons among us here. I think you would say that the implications of doing shoddy work are pretty dramatic in your field if you are a surgeon. We have some civil engineers in our midst. I think we all care that the bridges we drive over are put together properly, made with good materials. We have some among us who work in the aerospace industry. I think we would all agree that we care that the engineers and the manufacturers of the planes we fly in across the ocean, that they're on their game, that they are taking every precaution, are using only the best materials. We have some among us who are in the food services industry. It matters that you are taking every precaution for hygiene, good kitchen practices, proper storage and refrigeration. If you don't do that, people fall ill. For those who engage in any form of ministry, any form of Christian leadership, Paul says, be careful how you build the church. Take care in your gospel work. The implications are significant, more significant perhaps than you ever realized. We need to take care how we build. We need to be careful in the work of ministry. We need to apply our best efforts to it, our best energy, our best praying, our most careful work, and we need to be sure that we are using only the best materials. You see, it's possible when building to opt for cheap materials. I mentioned the other day I was working on a little project at home. I, I decided that I would uh, retile a couple of sections of flooring on our main floor in our house, primarily just the entranceway as you come in. This was a, a very bold and an uneducated uh, decision. Uh, 
uneducated for uh, someone who has never laid down a tile in his life to try and do this. But, you know, once you start smashing out the old tiles, you're kind of committed. You know, you need to carry through at that stage. Well, thinking that it would be good, as I normally do think, that, you know, to do this as cheaply as possible, I went to the big box home improvement store and I I saw piles of inexpensive tiles all stacked on the floor and I, I, I did the math and I figured we could have this job done for almost no money and you know the tiles, they, they would be okay, they would be fine. <clears throat> but Gemma pointed out um, that if you're going to do all the work of smashing up the old tile and laying down new tile, you probably want to put down some flooring that you'd actually want to look at, you know, some flooring of decent